we'll get started. Um, and I, the uh, picture you see before you is uh, obviously cherry blossoms. And just so that you know, right now is cherry blossom season in Japan, which depending upon where you are, if you're in the Tokyo or yeah, basically the Tokyo area right now I think that's is. A plum blossom. Oh, that mm -hmm. that is a plum blossom. <laughs> but they, but they come out about the same time. They come out about the same time. Um, but cherry blossom season lasts about two weeks, and um, we'll talk about that a, a little bit more in a moment. And the thing about that is that they, if you're in the Tokyo area, they come out about the same time as. Uh, the equinox, and it's a huge part of Japanese life and culture and history. And so, observing them and celebrating it is hanami, which is literally means flower viewing, and it attracts all kinds of people alike. And I, I, I'll tell you very briefly. I remember the very first time I went to a hanami festival, a hanami party, and it was with my father-in-law's. Um, group that was based upon the, the the drinking place, the Nomia that he normally went to. So I knew a lot of people because I'd go there with him. But I had no idea what it was going to be like. And I imagined the economy party would be we would sit out in sort of a picnic atmosphere and on, you know, blankets or whatever and enjoy each other's company and just revel in the cherry blossoms of sakura and i think the only time i noticed the sakura was when they were dropping in my sake cup <laughs> because <laughs> it's also an opportunity to to drink a lot of sake and and eat a lot of foods and but it's a, it's a great time of the year to be in japan um and but for many this season in in japan this season is one of the highlights of the year which happens to occur during spring ohiga in tokyo if you're in if you're in Sapporo, in Hokkaido, which is about the same latitude as Albany, it'll be about a month later, just to give you an idea. Um, anyway, next, please. So this evening, I'm going to discuss spring Ohigan. And Ohigan occurs twice a year. It's centered on the equinox and for the week around the equinox, one in the spring and one in the fall. And often during Ohigan at our temple, we discuss the six pyramids of the six perfections. And also Ohigan is when, before the COVID pandemic, we had two of our weekend retreats. The Sangha members who have attended the retreats are steeped in the practices that have become a core set of the observances at, at the Institute here. And we look forward to returning to this practice you know, fairly soon. Twice a year, Ohigan is the focus for the discussion. So therefore, it, you know, if I discuss the same thing every time, it would get pretty old. On the other hand, I think that it's good to discuss it for the people who haven't attended before, haven't been exposed to it. And the other part of it is that, like many religious observances, it's a time to um, renew and refresh on some of the basic principles and some of the basic ideas. So I don't feel too badly about it if we if we do the same things periodically. But recognizing that most of the members of the Sangha, both local and Maha Sangha, are not Japanese, and the cultural components seem to may seem strange and perhaps not relevant for non-Japanese, I'm going to expand the discussions in ways that I haven't in the past. Next, please. But I'll give you a little bit of, of background first so that you know what the tradition is. Egon comes from the Sanskrit word para, the world of birth and death called this shore. In Japanese, it's called Shigan. The realm of Nirvana is the other shore. And of course, we view this shore as our daily lives, samsara, which is punctuated by dukkha. Uh, so there's this shore, which is the samsaric mundane, and there's the other shore, which is viewed as Nirvana. The equinox is a time of the year in which you have equal amounts of day and light, day and night. And it's viewed as a period when the world of the material, the mundane, is closest in proximity to the spirit world. 
in some traditions such as uh, Jero Shinshu, which is Pure Land schools, they look at the other world as being that of not Nirvana necessarily, but of the Jodo world, when the spirits of our ancestors are closest to us. In a more orthodox context, it represents the relationship between samsara and nirvana. And this isn't just a metaphor. We often perceive samsara and nirvana as opposites, samsara the mundane, nirvana being the absolute. They exist equally in all of us at all times. And I'll note this concept varies in terms of the different forms of Buddhism. And so when I say this, I'm talking about the Ten Dai view specifically. How can we have a stream without two shores? When we stand on one shore, we look to the other. A juxtaposition of this shore with the other shore, samsara nirvana, and this is the middle way perspective. Time for contemplating our life and our deaths, our continuing awakening, a time to rededicate our lives to a moment by moment unfolding of our minds to realize the nature of reality. <clears throat> And a little bit of further background is the Prajnaparamita Hedraya or Hanya Shingyo, the Heart Sutra. Many of us have used the phrase para, which is Higan, numberless times. The very title of the Heart Sutra, Prajnaparamita Hadraya Sutra, or Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And at the conclusion of the sutra, the Bodhisattva Avalokitsavara who is being addressed in the sutta very, at the very beginning when it starts at Avalokitsavara Bodhisattva, doing deep prajnaparamita, etc., um, is addressing Shakyamuni Buddha, and then he's responding to her. Avalokitsavara says to Shariputra, Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom is the mantra of great wisdom, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra that completely soothes all suffering. Because it is not false, it should be known to be true. The mantra perfection of wisdom is stated, gate gate paragate parsam gate bodhisvaha. The key word is bodhi, which means awakening. The awakening of oneself, the awakening of the others through our efforts, and the awakening beyond the phenomenological. Gate means gone. We repeat twice as in gate gate or gone, gone. Paragate means gone to the farthest shore, which is common Sanskrit expression used by Jains and Buddhists to refer to, refer to Arhants, one who has gained insight into the <coughs> nature of existence and has achieved nirvana and liberation through endless cycles of rebirth. Mahayana Buddhism traditions have used the term for people far advanced along the path of enlightenment, but who may not have reached full Buddhi, Buddha, Buddhahood or have chosen not to reach full Buddhahood. And the term para means the bank of the river opposite to the one in which one is presently standing. Parasamgate, gate gate para gate parasamgate, means completely gone, gone to the farther shore. The prefix sam means completely, thorough, altogether. And svaha, which is really interesting because svaha is a particle from the Vedic Sanskrit, which does not have a direct translation. It is said to be the name of the wife of Agni, the fire deity in the Vedic Sutras, and it's used at the end of the recitation that accompanies a burnt offering made at a Vedic sacrifice. It cannot really be translated because it's a performative word rather than a word that conveys meaning. It is sometimes translated from the Tibetan as all hail. Other Buddhist translations and other schools are as fulfilled. I use so be it, as I often do when making blessings, dharma talks, etc. The whole mantra literally translated comes out in translation as gone, gone, gone to the other shore, awakened, so be it. Keep in mind that the explicit teaching of the Prajnaparamita Sutras is that of shunyata, emptiness or the void. Thus, everything in the sutra up to the mantra provides explicit teaching, and the mantra provides implicit teaching. Next, please. Now I'm going to go all cultural on you. Ohigan in Japan, 
one of the ways that Ohigan is observed in Japan, when I say observed in Japan, it should be noted that Ohigan is not observed by Buddhists in other parts of Asia. It's one of the few uh, observances which is unique to Japan. And it seems to be exclusively uh, coming from a tradition that dates to Heian Japan, which would have started around 800. And the name itself is 800 CE. And the name itself is reminiscent of the euphemism found many times over in Buddhist literature that refers going to the other shore. In 806, Emperor Kanmu, or Hiezei, depending upon the reading of it, declared that all of the Kokobunji, Kokobunji were regional temples that were established uh, during the uh, 8th century, conduct services in observance of the equinox and the week surrounding it. And here I, I, I find it really interesting because Japanese Buddhism is more in turn in tune with agricultural events and seasons compared to Buddhism in other parts of Asia. And it's often said that Buddhism was really developed unlike the Abrahamic traditions, which are based upon agricultural cycles for the most part, especially Judaism. Um, Buddhism as a whole tended to be more urban based and therefore tended not to be based on the agricultural cycles to the same extent. Uh, reading between the lines of the scant literature about Egon, of which I gotta say there's not a big literature, um, and partly that is because it's a Japanese phenomenon, not a generalized Buddhist phenomenon. The initiation of the Higan celebrations came shortly after as a result of the syncretism between Buddhism and Shinto in Japanese called Hongji Suijaku. Other events such as Obon New Year's observances as well as Buddhist dates as Gautama's birth, Chakamana Buddha's death, awakening, have associated dates elsewhere throughout East Asia. So in fact, Ohigan tends to be something of a, of a Japanese Buddhist uh, observance as opposed to a general Buddhist observance. And I think to make the point, um, it's one of the reasons that appeals to me so much because it is more based upon seasonality, unlike the other, other Buddhist traditions. Next, please. And when I think of, of Ohigan, it makes me think of the beginning of cherry blossom season, as I said before, in Hanami, Hanami or Sakura viewing festivals and parties. This is just for fun. I mean, Hanami is a time to enjoy, to get together with people, to, um, to drink, to have good foods, to enjoy the, the season, to get out. Um, and when we combine that with Ohigan, it means that that's a backdrop that's going to be taking in place, taking place in Japan in observance at the same time that Ohigan is taking place. Thus, while the activities may have, meaning the Ohigan activities, may have a very serious and devoted purpose, there's still a sense of lightness and an awakening and a renewal at the same time, uh, which is different than some of the other, uh, Jap other Buddhist in general, other Buddhist observances. Next, please. Ohikan memorials and respecting the ancestors. There are four times a year that the Japanese people take a time to visit their family's grave sites <clears throat> and have memorials said for the departed. The four times are New Year's period, Obon, which is in the summer, and the two Ohigan periods in the fall and the spring. And people will go to the family monuments, clean them with water, place flowers, perhaps even put food items out in the memory of the family members who have died. I, I see there that there's a um, uh, citrus fruit of some sort and a can of Sapporo beer. Um, that's not unusual to see at a memorial. And often people refer to this as ancestor of your worship. And I just want to let people know that that terminology is a holdover from Western Christian observers who marginalized sacred obligations of people who weren't Christian. So the idea of ancestor worship is really a misnomer. It's the vener veneration of ancestors, but it's not certainly not worship. In the West, we have a very modified form of such 
as when Jewish people dedicate the cemetery monument one year after the burial of a family member would be an example of of going to the cemetery and the, mo and the monument to, to observe something. In Japan, it's both a memorial, that is to say a memorial service conducted by a, a priest or a Jero Shinshu minister, and a showing of gratitude for those who have gone before uh, for what they've given us. So it, in many ways, the respecting of the ancestors is a way of showing gratitude for those who have gone before us both our, our individual families, but also to others. And I think we can learn a lot about gratitude by observing this, though I have no expectation the West we're going to follow the practice because it's not part of our worldview. And more on that in just a moment. Thanks, please. Another thing that takes place during Ohigan are pilgrimages. These pilgrimages during Ohigan are unlike the longer pilgrimages that may take place a month or more, such as the famous Bando Sanju San Kasho, the Bando 33 Canon Pilgrimage, a series of 33 Buddhist temples in eastern Japan to Canon Vasatsu. These take about a month or so uh, to complete. Bando is the old name for what is now the Kanto region. The Kanto region is the area that is around. Uh, Kanagawa, Saitama, Tokyo, Guma, Ibaraki, Tochiki, and, and Chiba. Or the similar Saigoku Sanju Sancho or Saigoku Canon pilgrimage of 33 Buddhist temples throughout the Kansai region of Japan. One of the points I want to make about this also is that when people are going on these pilgrimages, whether we're talking about the longer 33 day pilgrimages or the shorter pilgrimages like that that would occur over one or just several days during um, Ohigan. It's, it's really interesting because the pilgrimages are not just to temples. They're also to Shinto shrines. They could be to sacred trees, sacred rocks. There are pilgrimages to sacred sites. And more about that in just, in just a moment. But the pilgrimages taken during Ohigan are mostly local <laughs> and only take a day or so total. And they're completed by the Shinja. Shinja are, in, in Japan, the people belonging to the temples are really uh, in, say, in three, three types. There's obviously the clergy, both male and female. Then there's the Danka members. The Danka members are the people who are physically members of the temple. They pay a certain amount of money to the temple every year. <laughs> Uh, in addition to meaning that they have, they can have memorial services and, and things like that done. It also means that um, they have the right to be buried in the cemetery of the particular temple to which they are a member. And then there's Shinja, and Shinja are people who are more devoted. They tend to be people who are um, likely to show up for things like pilgrimages, are more likely to show up or um, a temple activity that is more generalized. Whereas a Danka member, they're going to show up for memorial services. They're going to clean the, you know, the, the monuments and that sort of thing. The Shinja are the people. I, I, I think of Shinja. You know, we, we all of us, you know, if we're if we're coming from the United States or we're coming from Europe, you know, the the little old Catholic ladies that go to mass every morning. Those are the Shinja. <laughs> <laughs> That would that would be that would be the, the Catholic equivalent of the Shinja. <laughs> the, right, the society. Or 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 the uh, Knights of Columbus, you know. Oh, my or, or you know, any any of those any of those groups. So <clears throat> we see that the pilgrimages take place by are completed by the Shinja or more or more devoted uh, Danka members of the temple, and the sites visited, as I said, are not restricted to temples belonging to a single sect of Buddhism, usually including Shinto shrines and other sacred things. And so it's, it's really interesting that temple that Tamami and I lived at uh, for several years was uh, Tamunin, and, and we essentially were the leaders of uh, the cleric leaders of that, of that temple. And even in that temple, which is a Tendai temple, one, it had two sites, 
that the pilgrims would stop at and they would say the heart sutra or other other sutras, etc. One of the sites at a Tendai temple was actually a Shingon site. And so you see a lot of cross-sectarian um, involvement during these during these pilgrimages. And these occasions are also deeply embedded within the Chinese, Japanese social milieu because the pilgrims visiting a given Buddhist temple, Otera, or a shrine, a Jinja, are welcomed by the members of the congregation. So when the pilgrims show up, it's an honor for the congregants of that particular shrine or, or temple or, or even those who were uh, especially um, taking care of a sacred site like a tree or a rock or something along those lines. That's a time to get together. You have, uh, it could be lunch, it could be dinner, it could be, in some cases, if it's taking several days, a place to stay overnight. Um, and so it's an opportunity for the people to get together in a way that they wouldn't otherwise get together on a normal basis. So at least, you know, once or twice a year, it means people from different villages will be will be joining together. And it's not unusual that the number of sites visited can be anywhere from a handful to several dozen, depending upon the length of the pilgrimage. In, in um, um, the Tamanin pilgrimage, that I, I shouldn't call it the Tamanin pilgrimage, that was one of the sites, but it was a pilgrimage in, in uh, that part of, of Japan that we lived in. Um, I don't remember now how many sites, it might have been 18 or something like that. And so we would stop for a period of time. But now, at one time, obviously, if we're talking about 100 years ago, everybody would have been on foot. And the, and the pilgrimage may have taken a week during the whole Ohigan period. But now, they get on a very nice bus and go from one site to the other. The difficulty about that is, if you're the priest, is when you get to each of the sites, you're expected to drink a lot of sake with everybody to be convivial. <laughs> well, if, if you're walking and it's taking a week, you have a chance to recover from the first site to the second <laughs> site to the third site. But now if you're traveling by bus, you don't have a lot of recovery time between site one and two and three and four. You know? but not that I complained a lot, but um, so, in the days before modern transportation communication, the occasions brought a sense of continuity and unity to people in different villages or neighborhoods together in meaningful ways, swapping stories, discussing issues of common interest. And here's a really important, I say this as a biomedical anthropologist, what was really important was it reduced genetic, it inc I should say it increased genetic diversity because young men and women would meet people from outside their village with which they might pair at a later time. So that's the way young men and women would meet young men and women outside their village that they might eventually have a relationship with. And so that, that, that became really, really important. Next, please. Ohigan outside of Japan. For the past 28 plus years, we've used the equinox and Higan to practice the six paramitas in discussions and retreats. And I suggest, suggest we'll continue to do so. And this is one of the practices was initiated during the first celebrations going back to the ninth century in Japan. And it seems fitting that we carry over this practice as we offer an alternative that fits the periods of equal darkness and light in a way that is consistent with what is done in Japan during pilgrimages and suits our capacity to encounter the sacred. Aside from being a Tendai Buddhist school and our temple a branch of the main temple Enrakuji in Japan, why and how should we observe Ohigan? This really is something that I think about quite often. Here is where I'd like to develop a slightly different way of acknowledging Ohigan and at the same time examining some of the cultural distinctions. A comparison, the next piece. 
So I'd like to make a comparison to Euro-American and Asian uh, religious observances. The Abrahamic traditions, namely Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, we acknowledge the wide diversity of beliefs and practices within each tradition. However, they hold one thing in common, a day of the week set aside for rest, devotion, and prayer. Sabbath in Torah, Judaism, Hashem, God, created the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. Now, I won't do a deep dive, but that is, the, that is the source of the idea of the Sabbath. And early Christians observed both the Jewish Shabbat and set aside Sunday to gather. And there's many stories as to why they switched to Saturday only. One of which that I came across that I, I had no idea until I was, I was researching this is they switched to Sunday because Sunday is when many of the, quote, barbarians celebrated the sun. And by switching it to sun, they could proselytize the early Christians. I never, I was never aware of that. Had you heard about that? Yeah, I, I was, I was sort of surprised when I came across it. I didn't know it was Sunday. Uh, it was a Christian calendar. No, it wasn't. Oh. That wasn't a Christian calendar. Oh, well, at, at, by the fourth century, it was certainly a Christian calendar. But, but Sunday was called Sunday because that was the day that the quote-unquote pagans mm -hmm. observed their deans. Okay. Um, so Islam is a little bit different in that Friday is not considered a Sabbath day, a day of rest. Rather, the word Friday in Arabic is al jamia which means congregation. On Fridays, Muslims gather for a special congregational prayer in the early afternoon, which is required of all Muslim men. This Friday prayer is known as the Salat, of Jumaya, which can be thus be either a congregational prayer or a Friday prayer. The point being that there's a day of the week set aside for special prayers, congregates getting together, and for some, a day set aside for devotion and spiritual practices and rest. So, for instance, in Judaism, one uh, in Orthodox Judaism, I should say, there is no work. One cannot exchange money, you can't light a fire, you can't cut anything, etc. It separates you from the mundane events of life to, for complete rest. Um, and of course, up until the late 20th century, we had blue laws in the United mm -hmm. States, and I, I think there's, there are still some around in which certain stores can't be open, you can't sell alcohol, etc., etc. So, um, the major point being that the idea of setting aside a day a week is a theistic tradition that has a specific injunction from their sacred scriptures to observe such a day. In Asia, there's not an equivalent, except as I'll note in a minute. The Asian traditions, without a spiritual ba scriptural basis for a day of the week set aside to worship, there's a different pattern of observance. To put it another way, weekly observance is a Euro-American worldview, which I might add is what we do here at the Tendai Buddhist Institute. We meet on Wednesday evenings. Buddhism originated in northern India and spread throughout the length and breadth of Asia. Why? Because Buddhism is a universal religion. And by that I mean that it is a system, philosophy, and practices that address the human condition the largest, regardless of location or culture. However, all religions are embedded within a cultural context. Practices will vary from location to location based upon the specifics of the culture within that location. Looking only to the East, Buddhism in India spread to China. In China, it formed a web with Taoism, Confucianism, and a myriad of local religions, and took several hundred years before it became a Chinese religion. In turn, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism spread to Vietnam, Korea, and Japan, again, mixing with local traditions, including Taoism in Vietnam, Shamanism in Korea, and Shinto in Japan. And it good, again, it took several hundred years before Buddhism became a Vietnamese, Korean, or a Japanese religion. 
As previously mentioned, Buddhism is not exclusivist. It adapted, intermingled with, and became layered with the other religions, mostly local that existed in each place. Observances in much of traditional Asia are daily. At Abusadan, in the morning and evening in East Asia, meditation and or chanting, etc., takes place in the home. Gatherings at the temple take place during certain specific specified periods, such as Obon, New Year, memorial services, etc. Additionally, there's a blending of East Asian religions in this context. When there's a groundbreaking ceremony for a new building or a well is being dug, a Shinto priest will do a ceremony to appease the spirits of the land or the water, as the, the case may be. Before a political campaign or a business is undertaken, a large Bodhidharma doll will have one eye painted in as a dedication to work hard for the successful completion of the project, which, after the project is done, the other eye is painted in. The Bodhidharma being a Buddhist symbol of the, the first uh, Zen teacher in China that goes back to the, the sixth century. There are many examples of this sort of thing. There are Shinja devoted practitioners who are at the temples on a regular basis for periods such as those mentioned earlier. But weekly observance is not part of the pattern. This is a Euro-American phenomenon. Buddhism came to North American shores in the mid to 19th century, and it started that process anew in totally different locations. We, those whose culture is Euro-American, have a worldview and a set of expectations that incorporate weekly attendance to a house of worship and the attendant activities. We don't need to change our pattern of observance. Noting how it is done in Japan provides us with additional period of intensifying our practices and devotions, but we're probably not going to be taking time off of work to do a pilgrimage to sacred sites in our area, nor are most of us going to use this as an opportunity to visit our parents or our grandparents' memorial stones and clean them and leave uh, food and flowers for them. But might not be a bad idea. In many ways, our weekly attendance at the temple is how we choose to follow our Buddhist path. Let us not feel that we're slackers, but acknowledge that what can be done by others is great. There is, no way, there is no right way. This way is better than the other way. It reflects different patterns based on different cultural inputs from extant worldviews. Next, please. In conclusion, Egon is an interesting phenomena as a celebration or observance. We don't find the observance in other parts of Asia. It began in Japan as part of the mixing an adapting process a little over 1200 years ago. And Japanese Buddhists brought this custom to North America, either as import, export, or baggage, as Jan Natie phrases it. Like the Japanese, we're taking the core teachings, such as the six paramitas, excluding some of the purely Asian cultural elements and adding our own cultural elements, but retaining the universal Buddhist aspects. This process is not linear, and it can be frustrating or fun. And it's not always premeditated, it's organic, and it meets the worldview and needs of the resident populations in a way that will be meaningful for us. Enjoy the ride. Next. And this is just some of the sources that I used in this. And I have to say that a lot of the sources really come from Ichishima Sensei and conversations with with Schumann, uh, because it's amazing how little information there is on 